Straight ahead on 12 News, concern over invasive carp, what two federal lawmakers want to do about the problem. Plus, an investigation update, what the parents of missing Amy Pontiac say about the police search. But first, a vacation that turned into a harrowing experience for a Brooklyn Park man. I thought I was going to die right before the plane hit the tree. 12 News starts right now. Hello everyone, a Brooklyn Park man says he is lucky to be alive after a plane he was riding in crashed while it was trying to land. The plane crashed on Saturday on Madeline Island, which is located in northern Wisconsin on Lake Superior. As Sonia Goins reports, investigators are still trying to determine what caused that accident. So we got two songs on the radio. My song, Blow Me Away, hit number two on the top 50 charts. Just as Jason Kingsman's musical career started to soar. No, I didn't kiss the ground. I'm uh, thankful I'm here, though. A plane accident grounded him. I thought it was going to be a fun adventure. I didn't think the plane was going to crash. His one-day getaway to paradise quickly took a turn for the worse. I remember as soon as we hit the runway, the front of the plane had a big, huge bang. Kingsman and two other people were flying in a 1974 Piper Cherokee. And I'm like, okay, I thought maybe the wheel broke or something. And then we started going out of control. And I'm like, oh my God, here we go. And then all of a sudden the plane starts veering off to the left and then kind of jumps off the runway and kind of slams back down. The pilot was trying to land the small plane at Major Gilbert Field when it crashed. Honestly, I thought I was going to die right before the plane hit the tree. Like I can see the tree coming towards us. Kingsman was already recording the landing on his phone when the crash happened. So I unbuckled one of their seat belts to pilots and I like kind of dragged them out of the plane and they were all tripping over themselves and I'm kind of helping them out a little bit trying to make sure they're far enough distance from the plane. All three people on board walked away with a few bumps and bruises. Well, I'm just kind of like feeling a lot of pain in my neck. It feels like somebody's holding my neck and actually choking it really tight. And then my back on both sides of the bottom here is kind of messed up and then my whole leg coming down is kind of like real out of place. Kingsman says he appreciates life more after his near-death experience. So I'm real thankful. Um, it made me put life into a whole different perspective. You know, I'm gonna go a lot harder than I ever did before in life. I know that's yeah. a fact. And I have a lot more of appreciation for the people that I love. Now, Kingsman drove back home today. He told me he really didn't feel like getting back on a plane again. Meanwhile, FAA investigators are on the scene. They're trying to determine what caused the crash. And Mike and Alex, there have been three crashes in three years on Madeline Island. Oh, lucky man. Yeah. You're very lucky. <laughs> Thanks, Sonia. Nearly 25 years after she went missing from an Osseo gas station, the Amy Paniak investigation now involves additional items of interest. I believe every day we work on this, we're one step closer to finding her. Maple Grove Police Captain Keith Terlinden says the seven-day search last week of Amy Paniak's childhood home produced more data for the case, but he wouldn't comment on specific items collected. Meantime, Amy Paniak's mother, Susan Paniak, and Amy's non-biological father, Marshall Midden, returned to their Maple Grove home Tuesday after last week's property search. Susan Paniak tells 12 News that investigators took family photos and some, some of Amy's childhood writings. In August of 1989, Marshall Midden stopped at an Osseo gas station after returning from a day trip with the 13-year-old Amy. According to Midden, he went inside the gas station, and when he returned to the car, Amy was gone. Maple Grove's police captain says he is encouraged by the investigation process, and the goal remains the same, to bring the now 37-year-old Paniak home. I believe there's information to be gathered in this case, and I will say during the week we did receive tips that that uh, will help us I believe in the investigation so any piece of information is worthy of calling us if you have any information you are urged to call crime stoppers the number is 1-800-222-TIPS a bill aimed at fighting the spread of invasive carp in Minnesota is currently awaiting President Obama's signature and today Minnesota lawmakers met in Minneapolis to discuss the measure and Carissa Wyant reports I don't think we want uh, to have uh, Minnesota lose our fishing industry. We're the land of 10,000 lakes. Uh, we won't want to turn into the land of one million carp. Senator Amy Klobuchar and Representative Keith Ellison met in Minneapolis today, hoping to stop the spread of invasive carp. To do that, they want to close the upper St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam. We have an obligation to protect them. And so by closing this lock, 
I think that we are taking a step forward in being good stewards of this river and of this land that we're blessed to live in. It's no fish tail. These massive carp are capable of eating between 20 and 120 percent of their body weight each day, outcompeting native fish for food. If you give a man an invasive carp, he'll eat for a week, but if we keep invasive carp out of Minnesota, he'll be able to fish for a lifetime. At one time, this waterway was integral to the grain industry, but today lawmakers say that closing it is going to protect billions generated by the boating and tourism industries in Minnesota. The provision has bipartisan support from Minnesota legislators. This is a chance to really look at what we could do if we work together. The president is expected to sign the bill this week. It would close the dam within the year. In Minneapolis, Carissa Wyatt, 12 News. The Upper St. Anthony Falls Dam is one of the highest on the Mississippi River. It was built in 1963 and stands at 49 feet tall. The proposed Botano Light Rail Line crossed another milestone today. The Botano Advisory Policy Committee held its final meeting marking the close of the planning phase for the Botano Line. As we then hand off the Botano LRT project to the Metropolitan Council, they will form another group that will then take the project from here forward to ultimately when we're riding a train. So today uh, we take, we, this group has gotten together for for years to uh, get us this far and now we're to the point where it's time to um, turn the page. The routes for the Botano line are now established but public comment on the project remains open. The draft environmental impact statement for the project is also almost completed. The next step is to apply for federal funding. Brooklyn Center is studying what can be done to improve an intersection with high crash rates. Lots of horns on uh, rush hour traffic and lots of screeching uh, brakes. The intersection of 66th Avenue and Highway 252 ranks among the top 10 in the state for accidents. A six-month study is looking at what the options are in the future and also what can be done right away to improve safety, reduce traffic congestion, and make it easier for motorists trying to cross the highway. As far as the congestion, there is much. Frankly, I think the road needs to be um, expanded. I, I think it needs to be turned into a highway. I think they need to get rid of this residential uh, community and uh, accommodate the rest of Minnesota. Any talk of converting 252 to a freeway was taken out of the Met Council transportation plan several years ago. The current study is expected to make recommendations whether an expressway or freeway should be part of the vision for the future. This week, the Brooklyn Center City Council will study whether to allow Sunday taproom sales at Surly Brewing. The Brooklyn Center Brewer can sell beer at its taproom any day of the week except for Sunday. Legislation approved at the Capitol this session, though, would change that. However, each craft brewer would have to get approval from the city where the beer is sold. Lawmakers who pushed for the law say it will lead to greater economic opportunity for the state's booming craft beer industry. Before the new legislation, state law only allowed Sunday liquor sales at establishments that served food. Up next, extra protection against the sun, what doctors say people often forget to do regarding sunscreen. And then a little bit later in sports, highlights from a day of Memorial Day baseball playoffs. But first, a forecast that will feel more like early July. Hot, sticky sun arrives later this week. This is the time of year when the days are getting longer and the nights are getting shorter. Yeah, according to the U.S. Navy, the Twin Cities will get at least 15 hours of sunlight every day between now and July 23rd. But the extra sunlight means people need to take extra precautions to protect their skin. In today's Health Check, Delane Cleveland has more on what you need to know about sunscreen. The window of opportunity to enjoy some fun in the Minnesota sun is a short one in the Twin Cities, yet too much of a good thing can have some dangerous consequences. About one quarter of all people in their lifetime develop some sort of skin cancer. Dr. Brian Nelson of HCMC's Golden Valley Clinic says the simple act of putting on sunscreen can greatly reduce that risk. Putting sunscreen on uh, really reduces the aging of your skin, too. A glimpse at the sun care aisle at the local store shows a variety of sunscreen brands and various levels of SPF protection. When you take a look at SPF, they go from 2 to 100. Dr. Nelson warns no sunscreen product provides 100% protection. If you have an SPF 15, that blocks about 93% of the sunlight coming in. Sunblock SPF 30 is about 97%. 
Higher numbers really don't demonstrate that you're getting more blockage overall. However, SPF levels don't mean a thing if you're not applying enough to your skin. The old advice was to put on enough sunscreen to fill a shot glass, but now experts are saying that's not enough. When they talk about a shot glass, that's about one ounce. And one ounce covers an individual who is five foot four inches. Instead, the new recommendation is to apply two layers to the skin every two hours you're in the sun to get the proper amount. After about two hours in the sun, whatever sunblock or sunscreen that you do have doesn't really cover your entire skin after a couple hours. You do need to put on another application. And finally, make sure you're putting on sunscreen labeled broad spectrum to protect against both UVA and UVB rays. All spectrum reduces your risk of those particular type of um, cancers and wrinkles. For Health Check, Delane Cleveland, 12 News. Last week, Consumer Reports released the results of their annual sunscreen test, and out of the 20 products they sampled, they only recommend seven. For a complete list, you can go to our website, 12.tv. Well, looks like by the end of the week, we'll be needing some <laughs> of that. That's right. Uh, coming up, the reason for a celebration at Basswood Elementary in Maple Grove today. But first in sports, a great battle between two of the area's best boys lacrosse teams. John Jacobson has highlights of Champlin Park and Wyzetta when we come back. Well, John Jacobson joins us with sports, and uh, the rain held off long enough yeah. to get some good baseball in yesterday. It was. A couple of good games. We had four good games that were going on at that uh, Wintercrest Park on Monday. And we will get started with holiday section baseball. Section 5-3 teams have historically had games on Memorial Day, and four local squads made it into Monday's games. Maple Grove and sophomore pitcher Brett Schultz facing top seeded Tutino Gracie in one of those games. And he gets a strikeout here of Philip Roth of Grace to end the second inning. Crimson up 2 1 through 2. Big hit in the top of the fifth inning from Nate Erickson. He will ground a single through past second base and into right field. Isaac Collins scores. Jack Kiebelbeck scores. It's a two out, two run single by Erickson, making it 4 1 Crimson. Eagles do get a run back on the bottom of the fifth. Brennan Swan, opposite way single. The left field, Alex Halverson scores. And that makes it 4-2, to two, but that is all Grace can get off Schultz. He throws a complete game. Maple Grove wins 4-2, to two, and they will play again on Friday night. Champlain Park was also in the winner's bracket on Monday. Rebels facing defending section and state champion Moundsview. Already up 2-0 in this one. Moundsview's Joe Fredrickson adds to the lead with a single to right center. Tucker Grant is the second of two runners to score on the play, and it's 4-0 Mustangs after two. With the Osseo guys looking on after beating Centennial, Champlain Park's Riley Johnson singles to right. Bill Bly scores in the play, and the Rebels get on the board in the fourth inning. In the fifth, Trevor Kaminsky knocks a hit just fair down the line and right for the Rebels. Tim Munn speeds around to score, and Champlain Park is within 5-2. to two. But that's as close as they get. Wy Wyatt Meyer singles up the middle. That scores Alec Abercrombie, and Moundsview beats Champlain Park 6-2. to two. In elimination games this coming Wednesday at Midway Stadium, Tutino Grace meets Coon Rapids at 4 o'clock, with Osseo playing Champlain Park at 6.30. The winners will play Friday. Maple Grove and Moundsview are the two unbeatens. They play Friday at 8 at Midway with the winner advancing to the section final next week. In section 6-3A, winner's bracket play, St. Louis Park plays Benilde St. Margaret's and Armstrong takes on Wyzetta. The winners of those games play Wednesday at 7 at Parade. The prep lacrosse playoffs get underway this week. Two of the area's best boys teams met up to close out the regular season. Unbeaten Champlain Park hosting a good Wyzetta squad. First quarter, Wyzetta's Alex Campbell spins to his left, beats goalie Bryce Plunkett with a shot, and it's 1-1 after one. Wyzetta gets two goals in a row in the second. Brian Mahout finding Charlie Shermack for the goal, and the Trojans are up 3-1. But the Rebels, after tying the game, get a huge goal. The horn sounds here, ending the half. Nick Bundy bouncing one in. Champlain Park's up 4-3 at halftime. Fourth quarter, the Rebels up and up a two-goal lead. Gage Munson scoring. That one makes it 5-3. Just 15 seconds later, Mahoud works his way through the Rebels' defense, and he scores. And the Trojans are back to within one. But Champlain Park holds on on a last-minute attempt. 
Plunkett stops Mark Swartz, preserving a 5-4 win and an undefeated regular season for the Rebels. The Armstrong girls lacrosse team is the favorite in the Section 5 playoffs. On this week's Sports Jam show here on Channel 12, Jay Wilcox profiles the Falcons' Mari Verbaten. Here's a clip from that story. She's wrapping up a superb five-year career for the Armstrong girls lacrosse team. Mari Verbaten's become a go-to scorer on one of the state's better teams. I played varsity eighth grade year and I've I was really timid back then. There were like 12 seniors that year and I didn't really know what to do, but they definitely helped me um, improve my game. And as the years go by, playing in the off season, playing during season, I, I'm, I'm happy where I'm at right now. I'm just having a lot of fun. Mari's a very extraordinary player and she's a very good leader on the team and she's a great example for younger kids. And I've always looked up to her too. So she's a great person to lead at the team and she's doing very well right now. Verbaten entered the Falcons' regular season finale with a team-high 28 goals, but three others have also topped 20 goals. She's a star, but has willingly shared that spotlight. Now you can watch the rest of the Mari Verbaten story and all the week's highlights on Sports Jam. Watch it through Wednesday at 3.30, 6.30, and 9.30 p.m. here on Channel 12. Highlights from section baseball and softball coming up Wednesday starting at 4. All right, thanks a lot, John. Mm -hmm. Still ahead, baseball fever at Basswood. What caused members of the Twins to stop by the Maple Grove Elementary School when we come back? Finally, one of the most energetic, lively crowds you're ever going to see. Enthusiastic students at Basswood Elementary in Maple Grove gave a warm welcome to T.C. Bear and Minnesota Twins outfielder Sam Fold and the team's strength coach as well. Basswood was rewarded with the Twins visit because the school had the most people register for Hennepin County's Step To It Challenge. The teacher who organized the challenge says it's important for students to keep thinking about exercise as they head into the summer break. A lot of them resort back to video games and some inside activities and so our goal as a building is to keep our kids active. Sam Fold also revealed he has type 1 diabetes, something he's dealt with since he was 10 years old. He says keeping active has helped him cope with the condition. And teachers say that the students were surprised to see how active they really were and how many steps actually go into each activity. So it's kind of fun to find out. And always a big deal when the twins visit. Oh, absolutely. Big deal. I think yeah. it'd be hard to keep up with those yes, kids. Yes, yeah. I think so too. <laughs> that does it for us. Thanks so much for joining us. Stay with us. Community Corner is coming up next, and we'll see you again tomorrow.